we're going to be looking at verses 12 through 22 from 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. And would you stand with me as we honor the Lord on his day in his house as we read his word. 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 12. And we urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you, and to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Be at peace among yourselves. Now we exhort you, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all. See that no one renders evil for evil to anyone but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. Rejoice always, pray without ceasing, and here it is, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Do not quench the spirit, do not despise prophecies, test all things, hold fast what is good, abstain from every form of evil. Would you bow and pray with me again, please? Our Father and our God, we thank you again to be reminded like this from your precious word why we should be grateful, why we should be thankful. And that's just one of the several things in that list that you inspired the Apostle Paul through your Holy Spirit to tell the church at Thessalonica long ago. And yet those same things speak to your church today here at St. Clair Southern Baptist. That we would be the people of God. At peace with one another. Loving one another. Serving you and serving each other. Abstaining from every kind, every form of evil. But also God, throughout all of that, giving thanks to you in everything. In everything. Lord, we have so much to be thankful for. May we never, never forget that. Lord, if we do, as we sometimes are tempted to, would you remind us through your spirit that lives in us, remind us, Lord, what you've done for us. You've done something for us no one else could. You've done something better for us than anyone else could ever do. You've saved us from our sins. You brought us into life eternal. Thank you, God. May we sing, may we give, may we listen, may we worship, may we fellowship with each other and with you in such a way that you are pleased, that you look down on us and you smile when you see what we offer up to you, God, because we give you our best. Would you help us to always do that? In Christ's name, and all God's people said, amen. It has sometimes been called the church of mistaken priorities and the church of unnecessary anxieties. Does that sound like where we are today? I think so. Now you may be saying to yourself, well, maybe there's more in this letter than I thought was there, but the truth of the matter is there are many times today where Christians find themselves in the clutches of mistaken priorities and unnecessary anxieties. Let me explain that a little bit. The Christians of Thessalonica were very consumed with their concern over their dead loved ones. They had had brothers and sisters in Christ who had died, and they were very concerned about that. These Christians seemed to have gotten the impression somehow that the Lord Jesus Christ was going to return in their lifetimes. Now, folks, they're not wrong to think like that because could we simply say we think he's coming back in our lifetimes? I get this question a lot. Brother Bill, are we in the last days? I think we are. Well, when is that day? I don't know. I just know that we're in them. But there seemed to be a common misconception and assumption here among many early Christians here that somehow Jesus was, was coming back in their day. I don't really know how they came to that conclusion, but it was a rather common assumption of that day that he's coming back in our lifetime. Now, in Acts chapter 1, if you'll hold your place there in 1 Thessalonians, Five. Go back there with me just a moment. You know the story. The disciples are there on the Mount of Ascension. This is after Jesus has been resurrected. He's been with them for 40 days. And now they see the Lord Jesus Christ taken up to heaven. They see it there in Acts chapter 1. And while they're standing there, 
watching him go up into the sky, there are two men standing there in white apparel, and they say these words in chapter 1 of Acts, verse 11, Men of Galilee, why do you stand gazing up into heaven? This same Jesus who was taken up from you into heaven will so come in like manner as you see him go into heaven. Now, did anybody see a date there on that verse? There's no date there. There's no mention that on this day, in this month, in this year, there's nothing like that mentioned there, nothing. But we've had date setters ever since, and you know a few years ago, a gentleman who's now gone on to his reward had the country all upset because he knew for sure the day. And it, when that day came and went and it didn't happen, he said, well, I missed it by five months. Well, if he missed it, why would we ever trust him again? But he said it again, and he missed it again. There's still no date, my friends. There's no date. But somehow or another, the early Christians maybe read something into these words from Acts chapter 1. I don't know. But somehow they got this impression in their minds that it would not be long before the Lord Jesus Christ came back. Now, there are many today who seem to have the same idea. But these Thessalonians went a step further. They somehow got it into their heads that there was some sort of benefit or advantage to being on the earth on the day, on the time when Jesus Christ comes back. But if a Christian died before the Lord Jesus Christ came back, somehow he would be a second-class Christian, somehow at a disadvantage. So some in the church at Thessalonica seem to even go to the extent of suggesting that if you died before the Lord Jesus Christ came back, you would even finally be lost if you died before he came back. Now, I don't think that was the common view, but that was the more extreme view back in the days when Paul wrote this, of this more common view that if a Christian died before the Lord Jesus Christ came back, there would be some sort of disadvantage or some sort of loss of privilege there. He would, he would not be considered a first-rate Christian if he died before the Jesus came back. Now, I'm amazed today at how some people think it's an advantage to be alive when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. They think, boy, if you could just be there, uh, a man once said to a preacher, Brother, are you looking for the Lord Jesus Christ to come back? And the preacher said, Well, yes, as a matter of fact, I am. And the other man said, Well, he told me that he's going to come back before I die. Now, that man said that. He meant it, too. That preacher later said that he didn't realize that he was in the presence, the very presence of someone who had received special direct revelation from God, that he knew Jesus was coming back before he died. This seemed to be very important to that man, and I, I know you've met people like that. Everything's about the end times. That's all they want to talk about. Because this man and other people seem to have this idea that, the, that those Christians who die before Jesus comes back are not quite as special as those who are alive when he comes back. Well, folks, one reason that Paul had in writing this letter, and he actually wrote a second letter to the church at Thessalonica, was to put all that to rest, to put all that away, and to put those fears to rest. He says in the fourth chapter of 1 Thessalonians that these, to these believers in Thessalonica, he says, don't worry about your dead loved ones. Don't be concerned about that. They are okay. And when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back, they, in fact are going to have priority. Look at 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and go down to verse 17. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, verse 16. And the dead in Christ will rise when? First. The dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are alive and remain shall be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air, and thus we shall always be with the Lord, he says. When Jesus comes back, the dead in Christ will rise first. They will have priority. They're going to be raised first. There's not going to be some kind of rank or, 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 or scale or, or levels. He says, because in verse 7, he says, we shall be with the Lord. We shall be with the Lord. And he says, we will always be with the Lord. The same thing is going to be true of all of God's people. Now, it doesn't matter to me, folks, whether I'm in the grave or I'm alive when he comes back. I just want to go be with him, don't you? It doesn't matter if I'm in the grave. I want to go. I don't want to miss that. I want to go when the Lord Jesus Christ returns. So that was one thing that Paul is dealing with here in this letter, to put to rest these fears about this. But another one of Paul's purposes in writing 1 Thessalonians 
is to give these Christians a rebuke, a, a warning, a reprimand, if you would. I think it was a gentle one, not a harsh one. But it was a rebuke nonetheless for letting themselves get so upset over something that was beyond their control. You and I have no control of when Jesus comes back. We have no control over that. And yet some people stress over that all the time. Here they are running around worrying about this. They had even written Paul about it. They talked to Paul about this, communicated with him some way, that it was something that was beyond their control. They couldn't control this. So he wraps up this letter here in chapter 5 when he seems to say, now here are some things that you ought to be concerned about. Don't be concerned about things that you have no control over, but here are some things you ought to be concerned about. And starting down there in verse 12 of chapter 5, he gives a series of exhortations or encouragements. He says there in verse 12, he starts off, We urge you, brethren, to recognize those who labor among you and are over you in the Lord and admonish you. He's talking about the pastors of the churches. He says to esteem the pastor, he says. Very highly, he says in verse 13, to esteem them very highly in love for their work's sake. Not because he's a perfect man, folks. There's no such thing as a perfect pastor down here. Because there's no such thing as a perfect person down here. But because he's doing a great work, Paul says, esteem them highly for their work's sake, he says there in verse 13. Then he goes on to another part, in verse, the last part of verse 13, be at peace among yourselves. Verses 14 to 15, he says, we exhort you, here it is again, brethren, warn those who are unruly, comfort the faint-hearted, uphold the weak, be patient with all, see that no one renders evil for evil to anyone, but always pursue what is good, both for yourselves and for all. So he's giving them this list of things here. These are exhortations, encouragements, if you will. And in light of what we find here in chapter 5 in this letter to the Thessalonians, it seems like Paul is saying to them, now, you've been worrying about things that you have no control over. You've been stewing and fussing and fretting over all that stuff. And God will take care of all that when the Lord Jesus Christ comes back. And when Christ comes, everything is going to be okay for his children. Everything's going to be okay. Don't worry about that. But here are some things that you can control and these are things that you ought to be concerned about and even worried about to some measure. I think we all need to be reminded from time to time not to worry about things which we cannot control. We all know what happens when we fall into that trap of worrying about things that we can't control. What about this? What about that? How's that going to turn out? Folks, there is more angst and anxiety in these last few weeks ever since we voted. It makes you wonder, Does anybody? do any of these people ever sleep? Do you realize that this is at an epidemic level today where people are worrying about things that they have absolutely no control over? What's the economy going to do? What's the market going to do? You know what happens when you do that? What happens is you fail to give the proper time and attention and energy to the things that you can control. When you worry about stuff, you can't control. So Paul is correcting the priorities here in this first letter to the Thessalonians. Now, the thing I, I want you to see here, and I, I am getting to my point. Hang on, Mira, I'm getting to it. The thing I want you to see here this morning is that in this list of things that Paul gives them that they were to pay attention to, Paul includes in this list things that they should be concerned about, and it begins down there in verse 12, goes down to verse 22. But right there in the middle of the list of these things they ought to be concerned about is verse 18 where he says these words, In everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. This is God's will for you, he says. He's telling them, don't be so occupied, so upset, so over-concerned about when the Lord is going to come or about whether things are going to be okay when he comes. He says the Lord will come in due time and everything will be okay when he comes. But you be concerned about these things, and he lists these things here. And right there in the middle of these things, he says, give thanks. There it is, give thanks. Now, folks, that's something we ought to be concerned about, amen? We ought to be concerned about giving thanks. I want to divide this morning's message into on, the, on this 18th verse. We're going to be focused on this 18th verse into three parts. The first part is about the duty of thanksgiving. And he says it there in two words, give thanks. Second part is about the extent of this duty. And it's given here. The extent is, he says in two more words, in everything. So there's the duty, give thanks the extent in everything, and then thirdly, if we have time, we will get to the incentive or the reason for performing this duty, and it's down there in the last words of verse 18, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. So these are the three points, and we'll see how far we get. Here we go. 
the duty of thanksgiving, to give thanks. He says it there in the, in the middle of the verse, in verse 18, give thanks. I think we need those two little words now more than ever. If you're a Bible marker, if you're someone who highlights things and underlines things, I think you ought to underline that one right there. Give thanks. This is not a suggestion. This is not a thought or an idea or a wish or a hope. This is a command. Give thanks. He says it. We need those two words. Now grab onto something and hang on tight because here we go. I'm fixing to say something you're probably going to disagree with. So here it comes. And the truth of the matter is we need those words because we are not a very thankful people. Have you noticed that? We are not a very thankful people. Some of you know that we've been praying for Ryan to get a new job, and he's got one now. He's in the bank, a new bank coming to town here, and he's being trained for that. And he marvels at how people react in the drive through at the bank. Can you imagine that? And he's even said, Dad, it's amazing. Some people never say thanks at all about anything, ever. Some of us may have to swallow hard on that, and I can almost hear now those famous words, now, preacher. Anytime a pastor hears those words, he knows something's coming. I can hear my beloved brother, my beloved sister say, Now, preacher, there are a lot of things you can say about us, and we may be lacking a lot of areas, but this is not one of them. Now, we are truly a thankful people. And folks, please understand, I'm not so much talking about St. Clair Southern Baptist Church because I've seen how you are. I've seen how you are grateful and thankful. I've heard you say those words over and over again. Thank you to God. Thank you to each other. I think the St. Clair Southern Baptist Church is a thankful church. I'm talking more about what I see in general among Christian people. I see this lack of gratitude. I'm not, I'm not talking about unbelievers. I'm talking about Christian people in general. Believe it or not, I do get out of St. Clair from time to time. Now, this may shock you, but just recently, you can ask my wife, I walked into Walmart. How about that, huh? How about that? I walked in there, yeah. So I do get out from time to time, and I have opportunities to see other churches and other Christians and other preachers. And for whatever it's worth to you, my judgment is that we are not a very thankful people. We're just not. Would you like some proof of that? Well, try this. My proof is that we complain so much. Oh, do we complain? I've got a question for you this morning. If we are a thankful people, why do we complain so much? If we're thankful, why do we complain? It seems that complaining has become a national pastime. Do you find yourself falling into this? Does something like this ever happen to you? Uh, you pull into one of these drive through lanes at some fast food place where you're supposedly going to get your order fast, go through the drive through and you get behind some guy who seems to have ordered at least one of everything on their menu, and you wonder if he's going to need a pickup truck to haul all this food that he's ordering, and all you wanted was a cup of coffee. Has that ever happened to you? And before you know it, you realize what's happened. Now, I tell you this so you can pray for your pastor's sanctification. You suddenly realize you're complaining about how long it's taking about this guy in front of you. You're not sure that he's even got the constitutional right to order that much food in the first place and about whether or not he's ever going to get out of that line. And you could use some legal counsel there, maybe get a lawyer and find out that this man is going beyond his constitutional rights, and suddenly it dawns on you, your poor wife is sitting there beside you being subjected to all this, and there's absolutely nothing she can do about it unless she wanted to jump out of the car. Isn't that right, dear? So after you go on and on about this for quite a while, and at great length, you finally realize those words come back to you from James chapter 3. James chapter 3, verse 9, where James says, With the tongue we bless our God and Father, and with it we curse men who have been made in the similitude of God. Out of the same mouth proceed blessing and cursing. My brethren, he says, these things ought not to be so. We shouldn't be like this. Talking about blessing and cursing there, coming from the same mouth. Now, please understand, your preacher does not use profanity. I don't. I want you to know that, when, that I don't do that. But in, in a sense, I was cursing by complaining. Now, am I the only one who goes through this? Hello? Am I the only one who goes through this? Hmm. Out of the same mouth, blessing and cursing. You've got this trouble too? Hmm, me too. But Paul says our duty is to give thanks. And then I realized 
that I was wrong when this happened. Just plain wrong. There was no other way to say it. It's easy to fall into this trap of complaining, isn't it? It's easy to fall into that trap. We go into a restaurant if we can these days, and, and the service isn't fast enough, and we complain. That was my problem. And then finally, the food comes, and it's not quite cooked the way we want it, and we complain. Folks, I've been in restaurants, and maybe this happened to you, where I've seen people complain so much, so bitterly, I want to just crawl under a table somewhere and not even pretend that I know those people. You know what I'm talking about? I mean, they're terrible complainers. They, they make such an issue about how their food was. And then we complain the whole time and then leave some puny little tiny tip and, and say, well, you know, God bless you because we prayed over our meal before we ate. Now, what kind of an image do you think we're leaving with people like that? Like we're waving this big flag that says, see, we're Christians, see? Now, here it comes. We complain about the weather, don't we? Oh, and you know where the weather comes from. It's not from Channel 5, by the way. It's not. The weather comes from God. So this is another way of complaining about God. We complain about our mate. How about that? Easiest thing in the world is to do, isn't it? In order to complain about your mate, you usually got to look past at least 10 good things about them and focus on the one bad thing while you conveniently forget all of your bad habits. Would you be shocked if I told you that I snore when I sleep? Would that shock you? Now, my son says I have a distinctive sound when I snore. Something like, like a freight train, Dad, going through the house. Well, how about this? A woman came to her pastor one day, and she said, My husband is so stupid. He's just so stupid. The pastor said, Why'd you marry him? She said, Well, I guess I'm stupid too. And the preacher said, It sounds like a good match to me. <laughs> yeah. We complain about the government. Now, I'm confessing not your sins, but my own. They say gossip is the art of confessing the sins of other people. Well, I'm not gossiping. I'm confessing my own. We complain about our friends. How about that? Have you ever fallen into this trap where a friend does or says something to you that you don't quite agree with, you don't, lo you don't quite like, and then you begin to bring up things against him to just be critical about him? Do you ever do that? There's a verse back in the Old Testament, the book of Genesis, where Jacob said that he realized that Laban, his father-in-law, had turned his face away from him, that his face was not favorable toward him as before. You can read that later in Genesis 31. Ever have this happen to you with a friend? Ever have this experience? Your friend's face was once turned towards you, and now that friend's face is turned away from you. And you don't know what it was. You don't know what happened. Something happened, but you may never know what it is. You don't know, but something happened. That's the frustrating thing about this. But something happens. They turn away from you. They're no longer friendly to you. And it's not just limited to one issue either. That friend not only turns his face from you, but he begins to look for things in you that he wants to criticize. So everything you say, everything you do becomes a subject of criticism. There's something wrong with everything you do or say or think. And once you get into this fault-finding business, you know how it works? It's like a snowball going downhill. It just gets bigger and faster and bigger and faster. There's no place to stop. Some of us are very critical of our friends. Of course, we don't have any faults of our own, you see, obviously. So we can be critical. We complain about the prices. We complain about the cable TV going off, even for just a moment. We complain about our jobs. We complain about our bosses. We complain about our salaries. We complain about those people who teach and coach our kids. On and on and on we could go. Some people have even been known to complain about their churches. Can you imagine that? And yeah, they complain about their preachers too. Now, preachers are not completely without fault here. Many preachers spend practically every waking moment of their lives complaining about their people, their churches, their deacons, their, their members. But I want to say to you what James says over there in that third chapter. He says, brethren, these things ought not to be so. We ought not talk to one another like this. Occasionally I'm asked to explain, why has God blessed St. Clair Southern Baptist Church so much? Why is his hand of blessing on this church so much? One of the things I want to say anytime somebody asks me that is to explain why God has done this. And I tell them this, St. Clair Southern Baptist Church has been relatively free from this grumbling and complaining. And I thank God for that. And I fervently pray that that will continue, that we are not known as a bunch of grumblers. Aren't you glad of that? 
I sure am. Because I want to tell you something, my friends. God will not bless a grumbling church. He will not do it. He will not bless a grumbling people. Some of us said, well, now, Pastor, why do you say that? Well, all you got to do is look back there in the Old Testament. Remember, there's that one word that keeps coming up as they leave Egypt and go to the promised land. Remember that word? Murmur. Oh, they murmur and they murmur and they murmur. What are we going to eat? What are we going to drink? What about this? What about that? And, folks, there were, there were between 2 and 3 million people. You just think you had a bad time with your kids on vacation in the car. You try that times 2 or 3 million. This is, what about? What about it, Moses? What are we going to do? God constantly warned them about it. And when they didn't listen or pay attention to what he said, to his warning, what did he do? God judged them for that. He judged them for that. So I think we need these two little words, give thanks today. We need that because we have this tendency to fall into the clutches of complaining. I think it's safe to say in the past, Americans were not quite given over to complaining as much as they seem to be today. Complaining has always been around. Please understand, I know that. That's a human characteristic or habit from way, way back. But I think it's more in common today. And as I look over the history of the American people, it seems like there have been times in our history where thankfulness was plentiful where it prevailed, and there was less complaining. You know the story. I hope you tell your kids the story because they need to know it. When the first Americans came over on the Mayflower ship, you know what happened. They land there at Plymouth Rock in what is modern-day Massachusetts. And the first thing they do before they get off the ship is they get down on their knees and they thank God for what he did for them. And then when they get off the ship, they give another prayer of thanks. They get on land. And that practice of thanksgiving became ingrained in the life of the American people. Now, I don't know if you were raised this way or not, but believe me, my parents and grandparents, they all six of them made it very clear. When someone did something for us as kids, they made it very clear. If we didn't remember, they reminded us, boys, what do you say? And they anticipate us saying, thank you. Now, one time, my brother got pretty smart alecky about it. He said, well, you got any more? That's what he said, and that was not what my parents wanted him to say when somebody gave him something. You ever heard that phrase, knock on wood? You ever heard that phrase? You know where it comes from? It comes from farmers. It became a custom early in this nation's history for a farmer, when he got through a day's work or day's chores and he closed the barn door, he would knock on the door as a ceremonial way of saying thanks to God for that day's work for God's blessing, for that day, for God's provision, for God's protection. If you would stop and think about it, what did we sing a while ago? Count your blessings, folks. You would never get them all counted because there are so many, aren't there? There are so many. It was an expression of thanksgiving to God. Today we talk about knocking on wood. We don't really even know what we're talking about. So we need today those two words that Paul has there in verse 18, give thanks. Because we've lost that spirit of thanksgiving that used to be so much more present and prevalent in everyday life. And we do find it so easy to fall into the clutches of complaining. Well, quickly here, I said that was the duty of thanksgiving, but secondly, I want to look at the extent of it. Those two words there that come first in verse 18, here's the extent, in everything. In everything, give thanks. We're to carry this duty that far in everything. Paul says the extent of it is, Go to this extent that in everything you give thanks. Now, Paul, you notice Paul does not say to give thanks for everything. He doesn't say for everything. He says in everything. Ladies and gentlemen, I know this. We live in a sinful world. I know that. And frankly, there are some sinful things in this sinful world that I'm just not thankful for. I'm not thankful for abortion. Are you? I'm not. I'm not thankful for that at all. Years ago, a young couple was arrested for killing a newborn baby. If they had just had the common sense to wait a little bit longer, or to, to rather to have done that sooner, to kill that baby just a few hours sooner, they wouldn't have been arrested at all. Because you see, we've legally protected the killing of our own for over 40 years now. You talk about crazy times we live in. Murder is just now a matter of the clock. And yet now, abortions can be formed can be performed not only right up to the end of the pregnancy, but in some states like New York, if the child survives, that child can be and will be put to death. And people stood up and clapped about that when the governor signed it, even after the baby is born. Some think it's something that just happens so early that there's just a mass that's removed from the mother's body. It's not even a 
distinguishable form. It's not really human. Folks, that's not what the Bible says at all. The Bible is very clear. That is a human inside there. That's a little boy or a little girl. That is not just a mass of cells here. It's much more than that. It goes right up until the full extent. Folks, I, I, just, I just cannot be thankful for abortion. I cannot be. And there will come a time, you, you watch this, there will come a time, if it hasn't already got here, when America as a nation is not going to be thankful for it either. That day is coming. We think we're all thankful for it now. At least some people say, I'm thankful that I could do this and I'm legally protected. But folks, this thing is going to become a tremendous burden for this nation to bear. We've been killing millions, about 60 plus million of our own. What, we, what if one of those little boys or girls could have grown up to be the person who found the cure for corona? Oh, how about that? Oh, we found that. We don't need that. We could have found it sooner. How about that idea? Someone has estimated that millions upon millions of dollars of revenue are lost every year just by how many children we abort. And I, I can't help but wonder, is that a low number? I think it's very low. Now, uh, but let's go on here. I'm not, uh, I'm not thankful for abortion, but I'm not thankful for cancer either. I'm not. I'm not thankful for crime or for political corruption. But while we cannot give thanks for everything, Paul says we can give thanks in everything. How does that work? Child of God, I'm here to tell you today that no matter how demanding, no matter how difficult your circumstances are, you can give thanks in the midst of those circumstances, whatever they are. Well, you just said not be thankful for cancer. I'm not. But can God help you through cancer? Oh, yes, he can. And there are people sitting here who will tell you, God has helped me through it. And they know what I'm talking about. You can be thankful that you're a child of God. You can be thankful that he is with you in the midst of your trials. You can be thankful that his grace is sufficient. It's enough for you. And you can be thankful that he'll bring good out of your trials. Even if you don't think so, he can and he will. And you can be thankful that you don't have even more trials. How about that? And you can be thankful that there's coming a day when all your trials are going to be over. How about that? Now, I'm pretty thankful about that. In everything, Paul says, give thanks. Now, that's just a list of some things. That's just a sampling. There's other things you can be thankful for in the midst of your trials. I've told our men's group this many, many, many years ago. The great commentator, preacher, writer, Matthew Henry, whose commentaries are still some of the best-selling ones out there, was robbed one day. And he used it as an illustration of being thankful in everything. Someone said to him after he was robbed, well, how can you be thankful that you were robbed? He said, how can I be thankful? Here's how. First of all, even though I was robbed... I'm still thankful that all the robbers got was my money, and they didn't get much. How about that? They got my money, but didn't get much. They took all I had, but it wasn't much. Secondly, I'm thankful they took my wallet instead of my life. Thirdly, I'm thankful that I've never been robbed before. And fourthly, I'm thankful that I was robbed, and I was not the one who was doing the robbing. Now, folks, that's a thankful spirit. That's something to be thankful for. How about we, we say this, don't we? There but for the grace of God go I. We say that. So Paul gives us some good sound advice here when he says in everything. In the midst of your difficulty, whatever it is. In the midst of your trials. In the midst of your heartache. You will always have some reason, child of God, to give thanks. And much of your happiness, by the way, hinges on you learning the art of giving thanks even in the midst of your difficulties. That's where a lot of happiness comes from. It doesn't mean the difficulties don't hurt. It doesn't mean they're not real. But while they hurt and while they are real, you look beyond your difficulties and you see the God who is going to get you through that and you see your blessings because you have some now, don't you? You do. If you, think, if you can't thank God for anything else, you can thank him that you're a child of God. And one of these days, there's a day coming when there will be no more tears, no more trials, no more pain, no more suffering, no more sadness, no more sorrow. Every child of God can be thankful for that. Well, quickly, one thing, and then we pray. We've told you about the duty. Give thanks. We've told you about the extent in everything. Here's the third and final part. The reason, the incentive for performing this duty of thanksgiving. 
Someone says, why should we do all this? Why? Paul says, here's why. Last part of verse 18. For this is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. A lot of people say, well, I just don't know what God's will is. Well, here's one. Give thanks in everything. This is the will of God in Christ Jesus for you. Now, is that enough for you? That's enough for me. Here's the God who loved you with a love that passes all your understanding. This is an eternal love. Here's the God who gave you his own son, and he sent his son to go to Calvary's cross and bleed in agony for your sins. Here's the God who has given you his precious Holy Spirit so that you would walk with him and do what he says in order to work for him and do all the things he, he wants you to do. He works in your hearts through his Holy Spirit. Here's the God who has given you heaven forever, and he says, you be thankful because I want you to be. Now, that's good enough, isn't it? This is where you nod your head or say amen. That's good enough, isn't it? That's good enough for me. Is it good enough for you? The duty, give thanks. The extent of it, in everything. The reason for it, this is what God wants. This is the will of God. I am thankful for this verse. I am thankful for this passage. I think it will help me be less complaining, less of a complainer, and more of a thanker. How about you? Let's pray together. Father, we simply say thank you. Thank you for reminding us. Thank you, God, for taking us into a few moments of thinking carefully and clearly and closely about those two little words, give thanks. Father, you know the world we're in, a world filled with fear, confusion, chaos, where we wonder, does this country have a future anymore? And we know the answer to that. This country or any country only has a future as they follow you. That's our only hope. That's our only way out of this. That's our only help is to follow you, to do what you tell us. And one of those things you tell us is to give thanks. Not if we're in the mood, not if we feel like it, not if everything's going our way, but that we give thanks. In the midst of all of our circumstances, good or bad, you tell us to give thanks. And I am grateful, God, that you have put people in this place, in this church, in this house of God, who are grateful and thankful. And it's just like breathing to them to say thank you. They don't have to work it up. They don't have to try real hard and go against their nature. They naturally and easily say thank you. And God, I am grateful for people like that because they are appreciative. They are kind. They are considerate. But, Father, we're praying for all of us to be like that because we are surrounded by a world where very, very few people are like that anymore. And you have called us to be different. You have called us to shine and reflect the light of Christ, who is grateful and kind and considerate to a world that is dead and dying and decaying and lost, hopelessly lost, because you're the only one that can save it. You're the only one who has paid the price for the sins of others. We're praying today, God, that every person here has not only known that, but trusts that, follows that, believes that, agrees with that, and loves you and thanks you for that. And if we're not thankful today, God, if we are filled with complaints and criticism, dear God, would you help us to confess that even right now? Confess all that, get rid of all that, let go of all that. Someone's hurt our feelings, someone said something long ago, to get over that, let go of it, release that. All that does is drag us down and keep us from being the people you want us to be. And God, we want to be your people. Would you please help us do that today as we sing to you, as we give ourselves to you, as we hear your Holy Spirit speak to us and draw us to you, even in difficult days, that we would give ourselves to you, trust you, love you, and above all, thank you. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen.